The Justice of Kings by Richard Swan. No, I've got nothing funny to say. Got nothing funny to say? What? Is my whole life a lie? Am I... Am I not funny anymore? Hi guys, my name is Matt, also known as Miggins on Twitter, and welcome back to my channel, Hobbit Hole Books. If you are new here, I just want to say thank you for joining me. I do reviews, I do not funny things that people seem to find funny, but they just make me laugh. And I've just passed 250 subscribers, so check out the giveaway video if you haven't seen that yet. I just want to thank you all once again. It's amazing, amazing to kind of surpass that goal of mine and it's a joy and an honour to do this for you all. Now today I am talking about the book Justice of Kings by Richard Swan. This was a really really good book. Let me just say that off the bat. I can't contain my excitement. I honestly think it could be a contender for a book of the year right now especially as I'm part way through the sequel nearly halfway through and I that book I'm loving that one as well. And I know I say this so, so much, and I know I'm so enthusiastic, and there's loads of people out there probably thinking, this guy's such a hack, he always likes the books, he never does a bad book review. And it's true, but, you know, I genuinely read the books I enjoy. I am being honest with you. If this was crap, I would tell you guys, I would burn it in a dumpster fire just for the views. No. Maybe not quite that, actually, I'm quite unhinged, so you never know. Anyway, I genuinely loved this book. That's, you know, that's just the tagline for this review. I loved it so much. I, let me kind of tell you about how I got into it. So, I actually got this book. You'll be seeing a vlog at some point when I, I'm sort of partway through editing it of my trip to London a few months back where I saw Lord of the Rings. I went to visit Waterstones Piccadilly, and that's where I got this book. And it's one I'd seen blow up on Twitter and, and things and everybody was hyping it and I've been so disappointed recently with some books that haven't lived up to the hype. <clears throat> Red Rising. And so I temper my expectations because I really, really wanted to enjoy the book. And I thought I'd better lower my expectations going in because surely it cannot live up to all these wonderful things that people are saying about it. And no, it, it absolutely surpassed the hype. I do think lowering my expectations did assist with that, so I wasn't going in with super high expectations, so it was relatively easy to surpass what I was expecting, but still, I love, love, love this book, and let me tell you why. Now, I am going to try and keep this on track, so I'm going to be using my uh, written review to help me keep this from going off track into a mess. Let's read the blurb. It's only a short one. No man is above the law. From a major new voice in epic fantasy, the Justice of Kings introduces Sir Conrad von Volt, an emperor's justice who is a detective, judge and executioner all in one. But as chaos, and we all know I love chaos, threatens to engulf the empire, these are dangerous times to be a justice. Now, I mean, apart from the obvious hyping and exaggerating at the beginning there, I think that's a really cool blurb because it gives you enough of a flavour, but it doesn't spoil what's going on in this book. And believe you me, you do not want what's going on in this book spoiled for you. And so I'm going to be staying well clear of that today because it really surprised me and it can be difficult to shock me with, you know, where things are going. Now, it wasn't like a major, major twist, if that makes sense. It wasn't like a, oh my god, this person was this evil thing the whole time. It was more, like, okay, I didn't expect the book to go in this direction, which is one of the best kind of twists, I think. But yeah, so that was a blurb. 
And just in general, this book is, it's methodical but not slow. It's methodical like the Justice, uh, Conrad Von Volk, who is a very meticulous man. He's a man who stands with the law, who upholds it, and he, he is... Uh, he he likes to think of himself as an upstanding citizen, incredibly self-righteous and incredibly sort of prim and proper most of the time, though they, the cracks do start to show. And so this book is kind of paced like that. It is You can tell that Richard Swan, he used to be a lawyer, he knows the kind of procedures and things that go on in a court of law and so you can feel that vibing throughout the very heart of this book but there's also a character drama now i don't think it's really a spoiler to say that surprisingly the main character of this book isn't particularly sir conrad von Volt, which is what all the marketing kind of focused on and i know that it surprised a lot of reviewers because we actually get it from the perspective of his apprentice helena now, Helena, she's the young apprentice to Sir Conan Von Volt, and she's our eyes into this world. She has this, um, she, she kind of has a foot in both worlds. She comes from a place where she was a, a, a kind of vagabond, and Von Volt had rescued, rescued her from that life, but she's also on her pathway to becoming a justice, and so she... She plays as a stand-in for the reader that, that brings us into this world, but also has a foot in that prim and proper world that Sir Conrad does. Now, all the characters do bring something to the table here, but we do spend the vast majority of the book inside, you know, Helena's head. And Helena is a fascinating character, but we'll get more into more of that later. I just want to read you the first line because I, I love the way it opened. It is a strange thing to think that the end of the Empire of the Wolf and all the death and devastation that came of it trace its long roots back to the tiny and insignificant village of Rill. I think that really kind of sets the tone. It it lets us know, oh, there's something going on in the future. There's this, it's all about the destruction of this empire. And you sort of think at first, oh, well, isn't that kind of telling us? But you do not know where this goes and the, the part of the enjoyment of the story comes from seeing how this empire is slowly falling and degrading and this carries on into the sequel. So what is this world like? So it's a Germanic inspired world, it's, you know, it's not unique in fantasy, it's, it does fit that kind of Western European mould, but it's, there's, there is its own distinctive flavour to it. it Clearly, uh, Swan has put a lot of thought into the language that he uses that kind of ingratiate you, the reader, into this world. And there's different regions. And although it's you know inspired by that classic European fantasy setting, it does have its own kind of quirks and things, particularly in the magic system, which I will say is a, it's a soft magic system. But I love the way it's implemented. I won't go into too much detail because, you know, that would be spoiler territory. But I really, really love the way it starts to creep into the story the further we go. And, and this just carries on and on as you get further into the story. The prose, I, I find it to be an effective mix. There's a sudden stylized sense to it. But also it didn't hold back the story. It wasn't, you know, purple prose per se. And the key information of the reader is put in there. One description I really found interesting was a description of ship masts as a, as a sea of, uh, as a forest. And I thought that was a really sort of inventive way. I'd never really thought of it that way. And it really created a picture in my mind, which can be really difficult to, to get for me. Now, to go back to Helena as our main POV, well, the only POV within this, she describes the story, it is a first person narrative from the narrative of Helena, and it is a, a flashback narrative, so she's telling the story from the future, looking back into the past. And so you do get these little insights from Helena, which at times were very interesting, other times it felt a little too sort of on the nose, like wink, wink, oh, it, the fool is coming, hint, hint. <laughs> but I overall it, it did work it balanced out and she is a very distinctive voice 
and it compels you to keep reading. And I think it was a very bold choice of Richard Swan to choose Helena as the character to tell the story through rather than Von Volt, which it, it would have been in another kind of more standard fantasy story. That's who the story would have been told from. But who are the rest of these enigmatic characters? Well, of course, you have Sir Conrad Von Volt, Helena, and then you have his assistant, Bresinger, and the town sheriff, Sir Radimir, who kind of form the crew that investigates this murder that occurs in this book. So when we start the book, we find Von Volt, Helena, and Bresinger, and they're out and about dealing with law and legal disputes across the empire and they find themselves drawn to this village where there has been a murder and then they find themselves drawn into wider conspiracies as the sheriff joins their group and more insidious forces start to emerge. Ooh. What begins as a small town murder mystery, which I really loved, soon becomes a symbol of something greater. It's a revolution. It, it's not just going to engulf the empire, but potentially many realms beyond the empire. And it's fascinating how, again, going back to the first line, it really encapsulates how it goes from this small scale narrative and just builds and builds and builds. And I really like just to go talk briefly about the sequel, how it kind of builds on book one, so it feels like it's almost like a part one and a part two. It's not a sequel, it's just a continuation, which I really enjoyed. I won't say much more than that, because to say any more would be a massive spoiler. And as I said, I really don't want to spoil anyone's experience, because you need to go into this book blind, pretty much. Um, so I think I've said more than enough about that. But I will kind of talk more about the feel to this book and how it made me feel. So I would say there's almost a Wild West kind of feel to this book. It's a murder mystery at its heart, but it, it is a character mystery. Von Vogt himself, as I said, he's prim, he's proper, he's enigmatic, but he does have these little cracks that start to emerge that let you inside the human. And his relationship with Helena is one of like a, a push and a pull where, where he opens up to her at times and you, you see little chinks within his armour and you really get to know who Von Vogt is and, and it's Helena's commentary on that that's really insightful and fascinating. But he's also pragmatic, which as a justice, you know, he only says and only does the necessary. He's very quiet. It's almost like a Geralt of Riviera vibe, but not quite that extreme. He and Helena, they have discussions on sort of jurisprudence and, and legal philosophy, and it's really fascinating. And honestly, I wish there was a little bit more of it. I mean, not that that detracts from the story, it's just kind of interesting um, and not something I've really sort of encountered or thought about before. Now, Helena herself, she is an unreliable narrator. Um, she's a troubled young woman, as I said, and torn between her duty to Von Volt, to, who's raised her up from rags into a life where she's very comfortable and, and has the possibility of, of a decent life full of many riches. And she's kind of hesitant to dip her toes fully in. But by the end of this book, does she have a choice? I don't know, you, you're going to have to read to find out. She, she's got this turmoil within her. This is all she's known since she was a kid, is Von Volt. And she had to fend for herself before, but now she's got this loyalty to Von Volt. And does she stay? Is this what she really wants, or is this just what she's always known? Her narrative is fascinatingly revealing, and it really allows us to dive deep into her fears, into her struggles and it creates this really compelling character arc. Now, one of the other unique aspects is seeing Von Volt through her eyes and the insights that, sh that she gives us as the reader through her perspective. And you do have to remember that it is her perspective, that she is an unreliable narrator. And so you're always sort of questioning things as you go through. At least I found that because there's always little comments that she's added on as she's reflecting on things that you know, she wouldn't have thought that time and you have to kind of separate these future comments from what's happening and and kind of take it all in. It's hard to describe. The pacing of the book, it's fairly consistent. As I said, it's, it's fairly methodical. It does really take off towards the end. There's a nice blend between the overarching storyline, 
but also the ongoing investigation and eventually obviously they all intertwine into this epic climax which I want to say reminiscent of Sanderson not in the not in the actual content but just in the style that it really really ramps it up and at times it, it did feel like there would be a, okay, this is the murder mystery storyline part, and now this is the, oh no, there's growing fears for the Empire part, and then, oh, back to the murder mystery. But Richard just managed to get it back on track, and especially as they start to connect between the two, it really kind of builds into one fascinating narrative. The central kind of mystery itself, the murder mystery, it worked okay. This is my only sort of disappointment with this book, really. Uh, it was incredibly linear, so we learnt the information as the characters did. And so there was a sense that you couldn't really investigate it yourself. I, on reflection, I don't think you would have been able to pinpoint it from sort of the beginning. You couldn't have worked it out yourself. You, you would have to go through all the stages of the investigation through the book to be able to figure it out, which I think is good because it's difficult, you know, it's not something that's easy or foreseeable. However... It does take a little bit out of the fun out of the mystery. There's a sense that you can't play a role in it yourself, that you're just a third party observer. And that was a little disappointing because I do love to kind of put the pieces together. And of course you are starting to question as you get more information, but I just wish there was a little bit more playfulness, a little bit more given that, that the reader could be more involved in the mystery and figuring it out while still maintaining that shroud of mystery and not making it too obvious. But the last 40% of the novel, oh my goodness, it really kicks off. It goes absolutely insane and there's a turn that absolutely shocked me. The tone of the book just completely upends and I was like, am I even reading, you know, the same book? Is it, What's happened? Is it... If I'm reading two different halves with, with the same characters, it was deeply, deeply chilling. It was, it was a, uh, you know, it was a moment I will not forget reading these scenes where sudden things start to emerge and it goes a little bit crazy. Crazy like me. And yeah, I, I mean, again, I don't want to say too much. I don't want to spoil anyone. But it, it, there's a sort of genre mashup that comes into it and it's incredibly effective and it felt very at home. It didn't feel like it was an invasion, like, oh, it doesn't quite fit together. It's, you know, it felt like this could be reality. And having been in book two and seeing more of this tone influence the narrative, it's just, oh, I've never read a book quite like this. And I'm so glad that I picked it up, but I'm also glad that I didn't know about it going in. Just kind of bring this to a close. Perhaps the best thing I can say about this book is that it made me care. I did very, very subtly cry. And that's not easy for an author to do with me. Um, the relationship between Von Vogt and Helena is, is professional, but it's beautiful. It's, it's really the heart of this narrative. And of course, you have the, the whole crew. We haven't really talked about Bressinger and Sir Radomir. Um, so I'll talk about them a little bit now. So it's, it's Bressinger, he's the assistant. He has his own kind of backstory, his own past. He's kind of um, quite a grumpy character, but in a humorous way. And he uses that as kind of a front. But he's also got a heart. He's got he's got a good heart. He he cares. Um, but he's not in it that much. And this does carry on to book two. I, I do feel that perhaps he was he has been kind of left behind a little bit. With Radomir, I really enjoyed Radomir. It's interesting the way we introduced to him, he's kind of a typical town kind of drunk sheriff almost. And I was thinking, oh here we go, it's you know the corrupt sheriff. But he actually surprised me with how different he managed to be. And he's one of my favourite characters actually going into the sequel. He he provides a lot of wisdom and he's also another entry point into the world because you know with Helena, she's been with Von Volk for a while, but with Sir Radomir, you know, he's just met him in this book and you know, he's really new to this world entirely and, and to the law. He's just, you know, the layman. He's got no idea, whereas Helena has some. And he's really, he's really sweet, Sir Radomir. So I really liked him. And I like the name Radomir. I don't know, it feels like, 
It feels like Radagast. It's, it feels, it rolls off the tongue. The characters really, they did make me care. And I do care about this empire and what happens to it. <clears throat> Now the climax of the book, it leaves it in a suitably exciting position whilst not leaving it on a major cliffhanger and book two does actually kind of start off literally from <coughs> where the last page ended pretty much. It kind of deals with all the necessary plot lines while still leaving this overwhelming feeling of unease that this isn't quite over yet, that there's more to come. And you will absolutely be compelled to read on. Overall, I can already tell this is going to be one of my favourite books of the year. I bombed through this book. This combination of character and genre blending mania is, is the only way I can think of to describe it. It was just wonderful. And I was going for a reading slump reading uh, after this. And I don't know if it's just a case of book hangover or, or what, but this book really stuck with me. Um, I highly, highly, highly recommend it. Even though the world building is, you know, typical European, I've seen some detractors say, you know, this, I'm not going to support this because it's not diverse enough. And I understand that I do, but I also think you'd be really missing out on a quality, quality novel. Um, really, seriously, one of the top contenders for book of the year. Uh, thank you guys once again for watching. I'm hoping to get a Scottish vlog out this weekend on my adventures up in Scotland. It depends on if I do overtime this weekend. Um, but hopefully you'll have something in your eye holes and ear holes by Sunday. And I can't wait to bring out more to you guys. Thank you all for subscribing. Please uh, like, share it. Um, I'd love to have more people come join in the fun here and find some new wonderful reads. And hopefully this book is among them. See you next time, guys.